be upon us, especially in the excitement of the formation of priests and the internships that take place in each of our parishes and institutions. Be with us, Lord, be with those who are interning, and also be with those who are indeed helping each in each parish and institution as a committee. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 And welcome to you all. So we'll, I'm Rick Singleton. I'm the provost of Queen Co Queen's College, and I also do the uh, director role for the internship program, or the full name of it, Supervised Parish Internship Program, or SPIP, as I write it. I usually don't call it SPIP, or you just call it internship, but uh, it's um, it's the uh, easy to write that. Uh, so. What we're about tonight is, uh, after we'll do a few introductions in a moment, we're going to uh, go through uh, a few slides and probably a little bit of time uh, using a video that I'll give you a copy of as well uh, to overview the whole notion of uh, supervision, to have a leaf through the manual and focus in on particular areas that are of importance to the field supervisor and especially the team, and also will take a little bit of time about con providing constructive feedback. That's a, a piece that was suggested to us by our teams in the past that we insert something on how to give feedback to individuals if things are not going well uh, and you spot it early or later on as far as that goes, you know, how do you uh, uh, give feedback without it uh, feeling like you're attacking the person or criticizing them and those kinds of stuff. So we have that. Uh, a short little section on that. So that's what we're going uh, going to do this evening. I also might mention that we're uh, recording the session because uh, the introduction to the program, the orientation to it is important for anyone who's participating. And there are three major components or stakeholder groups. Well, there's more than that. Four of Count Queen's College and five we call Count the Diocese uh, and a broader church. But on the particular internship arrangements, uh, there's of course the intern, and then there's the uh, field supervisor and the team uh, that supports them. And so we want to make sure that everyone who's involved understands their role and understands the role of others as well. So uh, that's why we, we uh, are providing sessions like this, uh, as well as uh, giving people opportunity to attend online and uh, recording it so it's available for individuals who are participating as teams uh, but uh, or participating in the teams but not able to attend the sessions and it's usually because of the time of year. Before we start I want to say thank you to all of you for several things for attending the session for sure taking the time to become better more familiar with the uh, internship program that we have at Queen's College, but even more than that for accepting this very special ministry of the church in helping people prepare themselves uh, for ordained ministry, prepare themselves for leadership in the church. And really what you're doing when you're doing that is preparing for the ongoing of the church, for it continuing into another generation. And so um, those are the things that you'll, you'll be doing uh, while you're part of an internship program and in support roles and in supervisory roles is to help uh, uh, really equip the saints, as it's said in scripture, equip the saints for the building of the kingdom of God. And uh, so this is a, a, great, uh, a great mission, a ministry, and we truly appreciate it. One of the things that we do uh, and uh, as a part of the wrap up to the uh, internship, we present a certificate to all of the parishes that participate, uh, designating them as a teaching church. You know, and St. Paul put a lot of emphasis, uh, emphasis on the role of the teaching church, teaching about Christ, helping people to come to know Christ is such an important part of what uh, it means to be a disciple of Christ. And it's not only that individuals teach, but the church teaches, because church is community. Church is the body of Christ, the followers of Christ. And by saying, more importantly, by doing, we are teaching church. 
and when we allow a student, an intern, to be embedded, we might say, in the faith community, in the teaching church, they see, they hear, they hopefully understand what it means to be part of community, and by the close working arrangement that they have with their field supervisor, their pastor, they really absorb what it means to take on leadership roles. We don't ask our uh, field supervisors to create, as the movie would call it, the mini-me's, <laughs> make someone just like yourself, but we know that the selection of people in the, to be field supervisors is uh, done because there are always, these are experienced pastors who have uh, uh, had a the broad array of ministerial experience that's needed to be able to allow a, a uh, student to be able to learn from that person. And uh, as I say, not to become exactly like them, but to get a sense of the resilience and the spirit and the joy of the ministry and of the leadership role in, in congregations. So that's what we're going to do, and uh, hopefully it won't take too long to do it, you're thinking. <laughs> uh, well, let's just start with a little bit of uh, something to draw attention to, to it in a, a scriptural way. Uh, Neil, you're online. Can you, uh, can you see our slides and hear me clearly? Yep, I just muted. I just mute myself so that if the house goes silly here, you won't hear. <laughs> right. I'm not sure. I hear you and see it. Yep. I'm doing good. Not sure if you're picking up to Harley uh, on the street, uh, but uh, <laughs> a bit of that here in this room. Okay. Well, so the, you my dog barking, so you're guaranteed to hear that, so I'll stay muted. Okay. It's a passage from Second Peter. He says. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through so these he has given us his very great and precious promises. So through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I select that passage to kind of give us a little bit of focus in at the beginning of uh, uh, my uh, orientation sessions on internship because in it, it draws attention to the progression of growth in the Christian life, the progression in discernment about what ministry is about. Notice how it moves from having faith into, and, and then on top of faith, it moves into not only believing, but having inner qualities of goodness. And then, of course, a lot of what we are about in theological education is having knowledge about God, about the church, about human behaviors, and pastoral needs, and what have you. But it's also about the character of the person, in that the person needs to have self control. And that's not only about managing the temptations of life that come to all of us, but sometimes the temptations to give way to the ways of the world, which are in many cases very much about materialism and consumerism and what have you, 
but we need self-control to keep ourselves focused on the gospel and on Jesus Christ. And in ministry and in mission, in the church, we need perseverance. We need to be able to stay at it because we know that it ain't going to be all accomplished in the first time at that, so to speak. That it's, uh, there are always challenges and obstacles and changes that come about from the time you sit down to think about something and plan it until you get to get at it and achieve it. So many things change is that perseverance is needed to keep adjusting to make it. And if there was ever a, a trait that is important in the life of the church, in the modern world, it's resilience or perseverance, being able to stay at it uh, when so much change and factors around us change that uh, make our best laid plans uh, uh, harder to accomplish. And it goes on on godliness and brotherly kindness and love. So when, when the interns are with you in your various parishes, it, uh, they will have, have the opportunity to experience where they are in their own character in relation to Christ and their readiness for ministry. But you also will have an opportunity to notice those things as well and to assist them, to advise them so that they are able to, we might say, stay on track or get on track or discover that there is a diff another or a different aspect to all of this than they had previously come across because of lack of life experience or the context in which they've grown up or been educated or whatever the case might be. I'll uh, make these slides available to you. I'll send them to David and to Neil and they can distribute them. I'm sure everyone's connected by email. But uh, what we're going to do before we move on any further now is just go around this table and uh, we'll start not at this table, but at a table on the Bjorn Peninsula where Neil Buffett can introduce himself and we'll take it from there. Neil, give us an introduction of yourself. Uh, <clears throat> Reverend Neil Buffett, ministry 15 years, two parishes, and I'm looking forward to, uh, and I guess, <laughs> sounds like a new chapter of uh, being a role model for somebody, I guess. Mm -hmm. So be prepared for another little Neil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> but that's it. That, that's, that's, that's who I am, I guess. It is. And thanks yeah. for being part of it. And as I said earlier, thanks for agreeing to take on a role. We'll start here and uh, start wherever. Let's start up on that corner. Uh, Chris and Mercer, I'm studying French at New Orleans. <clears throat> Good. And you're which parish? You're all, you're all, all saints. We're all saints. Okay, you're all all saints. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Dave Arnold, I'm all saints parish. Good. Great. I'm on there in the sorts of planning and um, so, uh, 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 some parish committee. Okay. So, and fellowship. Something that back to that Great to have you. Great to have you both. Great. Good. Uh, Wendy Taylor. Uh, most of my ministry tends to be with children or younger youth, and uh, I'm uh, looking forward to uh, being part of this team. Good. Ruby Kennedy, CBS, and I'm looking forward to this, being part of this team also. Great, good. Glad to have you say that. And we're looking forward to it as well. Mm -hmm. well thank you for that. Thank you for that. I'm I'm the saint from All Saints. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm the modest one. My name is David Pilling, and um, and I've been a priest for this is my 32nd year now, and uh, very much looking forward to continuing as an internship supervisor. Uh -huh. And and I, I'm very pleased with the team that we have from All Saints. Yeah, yeah, great selection, a great variety. I can say, yes. great. Thanks, David. And thanks for all of your support here at Queen's College over the years in numerous ways as a member of the corporation and then uh, coming in uh, to preside at liturgies and preach and uh, do classes for us as well. Thanks so much for that. Great. I'm Roger Peach. I'm a lifetime member of All Saints Parish, uh, currently serving on vestry and uh, looking forward to this uh, being on this team, serving on this team. Great. Excellent. Good. Well, Good evening. This is a new experience for me because I'm not 
out front involved in too much. My husband has been for years, and he's only been a member of our parish since he married me. But um, I'm getting more in, involved, I think, in the last 12 months anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but looking forward to it. Don't know. Sometimes I wonder what I've got myself into, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully any anxieties that you might have about what you're asked to get into will be... Uh, will be eradicated tonight. Uh, it's a really wonderful to have you part, all part of it. Welcome to you all. And uh, it'll hopefully be a, a good experience for everyone. And for those who might be watching this later online, we're glad that you're part of it as well. And uh, uh, you will know them by those who are here and uh, those who are online. Uh, any questions that are asked tonight, I expect they reflect who and what you are as well. Uh, the questions and our comments and the introductions also. So let's just push on a little bit more. Uh, we call this what's in a name on this slide. And uh, so our, our program is supervised parish internship. So supervised, of course, speaks for itself that it is the uh, someone is in charge of it. Well, some ones are in charge of it in a variety of ways. I mean, at Queen's College, we have uh, it organized. We're constantly revising it and making right fit with parish uh, situations and what have you. But it's about people who are preparing for ministry, pastoral ministry, to get a good hands-on parish experience. And uh, uh, one of the important things is that we make sure that when a person goes into the parish, the pastor is uh, the supervisor then. The pastor is the one who is overseeing uh, the intern and guiding them and what have you. We continue to be part of it, but we don't interfere in the relationship between the pastor and the, uh, and the intern. Uh, we I make it clear to them, and we'll come to a slide on a little bit later, that if there are issues or problems that come up, they need to go back to the uh, supervisor with them and work them out that way rather than doing you know kind of an end row on our own supervisor and uh, uh, then you know expecting me to go and sort it out I always tell them if you have an issue or problem and I say the same thing to the students who are here at the college if they have an issue or problem with a, a, a professor in a course or a pastor in a parish deal with it with them before you come to me and if you have want me involved you can come to see me but you got to put it in writing and what you put in writing i will be bringing to the other person because you can't deal with things based on you know what one person is telling you about it or their version of it and as the old saying goes no matter how thin you cut the baloney there's two sides to it <laughs> every issue and conflict and matter that comes up you need to at least get two two sides of it and then maybe even other sides as well, but at least uh, at least both parties' perspectives. So uh, the uh, Supervised Parish uh, Internship Program is really about the roles of uh, the field supervisors and the interns, and then there's a very important role for uh, the support team, and we'll come to that in a moment. So I try to uh, explain here a little bit of what supervisors are and what they aren't in terms of uh, the role. They are experts in the field, not only experts, but they're selected uh, because both the college and uh, the bishops uh, of the students see them as people who have something to bring and to offer to students preparing for, for leadership roles. And such is the case, of course, with, uh, with uh, David and with Neil uh, and with the others. And there are many clergy who can take it on. But... There are some who, who wouldn't be ready at this time in their own uh, appointments and roles and so on to take a, uh, take a student. So there are experts in, in the field who are usually settled in their ministry. We try not to uh, put students with somebody who is just moving into a place or uh, has have other unsettling things on the go at the time. Uh, as uh, supervisors, they are partners with the college. We identify all of our uh, uh, field supervisors in our uh, calendar as being part of our team, really, from Queen's College uh, because of this role. And they are advisors on readiness 
to us as we do our evaluations uh, on our students and make recommendations to the bishops on ordination and sometimes uh, a bishop might uh, contact uh, a field supervisor uh, of a uh, student uh, or a newly ordained person to inquire from the uh, field supervisor you know what uh, they were like basically look for a recommendation or a reference on them uh, uh, as they are making appointments or even making the decisions about uh, ordination it's a very it's a significant uh, role we asked the students in the in january the year before so last january uh, and you'll see in the manual here there's oodles of uh, forms there but the very first form is the application for internship and in that application they have to kind of state what their goals for their vocation would be and what they would like to learn during an internship and we talk about that with the students uh, prior to uh, to them completing the form. And uh, what I always emphasize to them is, you know, don't uh, look for a parish uh, to go and do more of what you've already been doing, unless you want to find out about doing it differently. But think of things that you know that you're likely to come across in parish ministry that you either are not very familiar with or even more so, that you're not very comfortable with. So, so you get an opportunity to uh, see it in, in action and to see it uh, being done by others and, and see it being done by yourself under the guidance of another for a while. For instance, if it's a student who is really concerned that they, they feel they, they, don't, they wouldn't be a good preacher, they think that he might be nervous in public speaking and communications and what have you, and uh, uh, those types of things, then that would probably be identified as one of their learning goals, so that over the course of the uh, uh, of the internship, the pastor would uh, help the student in their preparation, give them uh, some guidance, and our students get good studies in on homiletics and some good practice on it as well. And that's usually very different than doing it in a parish context. So uh, all of that is uh, part of how the supervisor particularly fits in is that students identify those types of things and then here at Queens working with the bishops we try to get a good match for the students uh, and and uh, what I've worked on since uh, over the last couple of years when I've been uh, responsible for the internship is getting that out the door early what used to happen they would remember it probably when you know the last week of august queen's calling the bishop to say like have you decided where so and so is going to go for their internship and then uh, the bishop was calling around pastors trying to say you know would, would you uh, take uh, an intern when next week <laughs> and uh, you know it wouldn't uh, didn't make for a good experience but uh, people always you know would make the effort to do their best but it wasn't certainly the best way to do it um, so that's part of why we, we get headed that much earlier but also to make sure that the students get uh, a, a chance to identify uh, what their issues and what I might be. A very important part though of what happens during an internship and uh, the supervisors and the team are important with this is that for the, the students, for the internships, uh, the, uh, interns, there's really a substantial what we might say shift in their identity because when they go into a parish they're identified as an intern uh, you know the, the, it's very clear that they that person's here with a special role and a very special purpose in preparing themselves for official leadership role as an ordained person in church so right away people start to kind of see you somewhat different because your vocation is being more or less solidified and your ready for readiness for ordination is uh, getting much closer and many times that's one of the things that uh, uh, interns come back with from their uh, uh, their discoveries things that they probably didn't write as uh, particular learning goals but uh, things that came about that they had never planned is that you know other people seem to be seeing me different and it took a while for me to get used to that and uh, 
uh, and what have you. And so it's part of bringing about their identity. It's also the time and place where, again, under supervisors, under field supervisors, uh, guidance and mentorship, where the intern gets opportunity to look at how they see things, how they think about things, and how committed they are to take on some of the major challenges that come uh, with being a, uh, uh, a person in full-time ministry uh, in the church. I try to point out that uh, supervisors are not simply overseers that look at, uh, at uh, you know, what time you arrive for work or uh, those types of things, although it is part of it. But they're not overseers in the sense of being very much uh, arm's length, they're part of the guidance and the life and the growth and the formation of the person. Mentorship is the better word for it than, than overseer. Supervisors are not best friends, you know, because there has to be a boundary between the student and the supervisor who needs to be able to give correction, help the person. Yes, understand and appreciate that there are things going on in the life of the person, but not to be the one who is hearing that and caring for the person as a best friend would be doing. Nor is the supervisor to be a therapist or spiritual director for the students. In fact, we give uh, caution on that to people that, uh, you know, and, and, and if you happen to be receiving counseling from someone uh, or spiritual director from so, uh, spiritual direction from someone and, uh, you know, it's going through the, uh, the, the placements, somebody suggests that you go with this person uh, in a, as an intern, uh, but it wouldn't be appropriate because in those types of roles you have, you know, a knowledge of personal things, confidential things about the person that ought not be part of uh, the uh, supervision uh, forum, we might say. So those are a, a few of the, the things uh, about the role of supervisors and what they are and what they aren't. There are inevitable differences between the supervisor and the intern. So as I said earlier, neither before, during and after are we looking to have the intern become a, a, a mold of the supervisor. We know that throughout the breadth and depth of the church for all people, including people in ministry and people who are preparing for ministry, there are differences in the amount of knowledge that people have and their skills and their experience. A lot of personal traits and abilities are quite different. And so we know that the two aren't going to be the same. We know that the people who are selected to be supervisors aren't going to be judging the interns based on whether or not they're, they're like me, but more are they like Christ in his context. That's the, the goal of it. Because most people try to be like Christ in a way that fits with their God-given gifts. And that's the beautiful thing, isn't it? We'll all go about doing that a little bit differently. The supervisor and the interns will have a difference in what their own goals and interests and theoretical and we might say theological orientations are you know some people have are pursuing one set of things for themselves personally and in ministry someone else kind of is geared in a different direction what have you that's just the way it is in the church but it still must all be within the church it must all be within the pursuit and the proclamation of the gospel and the kingdom of god but sometimes people are even a bit different in their own personal beliefs and their theological worldviews, as it's called. But still, doesn't mean they can't work together. In fact, it necessitates it. And that's some of the wonderful experience for interns is to be with someone who sees some things different than themselves and finding ways to be able to work with it. And we always ask the supervisors to keep an eye to how flexible the intern is how flexible you are yourself I suppose as well but generally speaking we'd be not inclined to put an intern with somebody who has a, a reputation for being uh, so rigid that uh, uh, they aren't able to accommodate the perspectives of others
so a big piece of what internship is about is really a person further dis discerning and refining their vocation. And I love this quote, and after I read it, we'll take a moment to allow yourselves, if you want to make any comment on it, to do so. This quote is from Evelyn and James Whitehead. They write, a Christian vocation is a gradual revelation of me to myself by God. Christian vocation is a gradual revelation of me to myself by God. This God reveals us gradually to ourselves. In this vision, a vocation is not some external role visited upon us. It is our own religious identity. It is who we are trying to happen. So, internship, when all else is said and done, about practicing skills and getting opportunity to observe and, and, and uh, participate in activities in the pastoral context and what have you. Along with that, it's a time and a way that a person will really do a soul-searching experience of, do I have a vocation to this? Is this what I'm called to? Is this what God has put in me to do? And is this what is coming out, as the Whiteheads describe it? So we'll take a moment to hear if anyone has any questions or, or more so comments or observations on this particular quote or, or any other thought or idea that has come to mind uh, since we started. Anything from anyone? I, I like that quote. One, the person I am now is not the person I started my mm -hmm. my ministry, ordained ministry, and mm -hmm. lay ministry as. Yeah. And I constantly find revelation taking place mm -hmm. uh, basically every day. Yeah, and, indeed. And uh, um, the depth of my ministry and, and mm. spirituality will go up and down, mm. Mm. but there's a general growth mm. that takes place. Yeah, 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 yeah. Many times people find themselves able to respond to things in different types of situations, sometimes trying situations, but others as well. But they never dreamed they'd be able to respond to. Them. Yes. And it's the vocation. You know, it's, it's what's in there coming out, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What God put in there. Yeah. I like the part where it says reveals us gradually to ourselves. Yeah. He knows yeah. that it's, it, sometimes it has to be step. Oh yeah, step, absolutely. Right? Like, you yeah. know, he's getting you to try to, to see yeah. it, yeah. and there's all different pieces. But I like that it's, yeah, it's yeah. gradually that he'll yeah 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 he'll yeah. see it. Yeah. Oh yeah, reveals us gradually to ourselves. Just uh, leap along to another nice quote, uh, and this one is from Mother Teresa. She says, many people mistake our work for our vocation. Our vocation is the love of Jesus. Our vocation is the love of Jesus. <laughs> Neil uh, is telling me here on a, a note that uh, he's having some mic issues. What have you? He mentions uh, that uh, a, sometimes it's the challenge of stepping outside our comfort zone and growing into ourselves. Thanks, Neil. 
Yeah, our vocation is the love of Jesus, and, and, and that comes at us both ways. It's the love of Jesus that's the root of everything that we do as Christian people. And when all else is said and done, what we do and the reason for doing it is the love of Jesus and to bring others to that if they discover it. The internship experience is one of growth and, and uh, discovery. For many, it's a time to think about things and sometimes make uh, adjustments to what we do and how we do it and discover why we do things the way we do. And all of that kind of is part of that growth or settling in our identity, in our own minds, discovering who it is that God is calling us to be and what it is God is calling us to be. But along with that, uh, how it will be seen in the broader community because of the vocation to which one is called and the, uh, the ministry to which one uh, is is called to take on, especially leadership in Christian community. William James was a, a 19th, early 20th century uh, uh, philosopher and psychologist and physician. But the thing that he liked most was what he, he drew on from his involvement with people as a physician and as a psychologist and his ponderings as a philosopher and, and studies in philosophy. And that is, you know, what makes people the way they are? Or character and those kinds of things. This sentence that he put together, some has written as a sentence, he said, you sow a thought and you reap an action. You sow an, ap an action and you reap a habit. You sow a habit and you reap a character, you sow a character, and you reap a destiny. Beautiful quote, isn't it? Because it really lays out for us how one thing becomes another in forming or shaping a person, whether it's ourselves, or whether it's parents forming their children, or what uh, people try to accomplish in teaching and in education or in preaching and uh, pastoral leadership, you know. And, and one of the important uh, tasks in what we do here in a college, people do in providing counseling and preaching and teaching and what have you, is to sow thought, people to think about something. Think about something that will lead them to do something. You sow a thought, you reap an action. But if it's a thought that is inspiring and life-giving and joy-giving, they will not only do it once, they will do it over and over and it becomes a habit for them to do it. And the habit then, of course, forms their character because they do it all the time. It's who they are. It takes on, it's their identity. And it's their identity within themselves, but it's also the identity of them with Christ. And so it really shapes their destiny, we could say, in this world and in the next. And uh, internship is, is that opportunity for a student. And... Uh, it's part of why having teams and pastors involved can help the student to reflect on the things they do. They do it all the time. If they're doing something that is, you know, isn't a good fit with the vocation or the role that they're taking on, then it's a good time to identify that and to probably start doing it a bit differently. Because that same sequence, those footsteps, one after the other, that William James lays out, going from a thought to an action to a habit to the character to the destiny, 
that's the flow, whether we're talking about good things or bad things in life. You know, people who think about ways to benefit themselves uh, will do things that will benefit themselves and themselves only. And it becomes a habit to be that way. And that takes on their character and their destiny as well. So it isn't as if that's only about doing what's nice and good. It's the flow. <laughs> the flow from actions to behaviors to the inner value levels, we might say, that we have as, uh, as human beings and the connection with the community. Any, any comments or thoughts before we move on to some other points? I guess uh, as a team working with an intern, and you, you see, if, like at the beginning part, if there is a little bit of a more of a negative mm -hmm. impact with the thought that's now the action, mm -hmm. we have an opportunity to help before it actually becomes the character and the destiny, no, yeah. shape yeah. it in more of a better direction. That's, that's right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I mean, you, from your life experience in parishes and in, 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 uh, families and everywhere else, I mean, you're able to tell the person, give feedback on, you know, what is the impact of behaving this way? I mean, whether it's something as simple as somebody that preaches long or is negative in their way of uh, uh, proclaiming the message when they preach or whatever the case might be, well, or critical of people and the ways of the world or whatever the case might be, well, you know, you're able to say what impact that has, you know, doesn't endear people to come back next time kind of thing, does it? So what we're talking about here is preparing people for ministry. And uh, I like to lay this question to people sometimes. What makes ordained ministry different from other helping professions? And there are many helping professions. Many Christians work in helping professions. So it's not as if ministry has uh, is the only uh, the only ones who live out Christian life. But what makes ministry? What makes ordained ministry different, uh, say, than nursing or social work or uh, counseling of some sort, and what have you? Any comments, thoughts, ideas on that? And I have some of the elements listed there. I'd like to hear your your thoughts or ideas on. Well, I think that uh, an ordained ministry there that we're talking about is like a shepherd leads the flock, and mm -hmm. the flock is looking to the shepherd for guidance and direction. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. like we just, like you said there before, about thoughts and habits. Mm -hmm. If you see something that's not probably what it should be, you feel as if sometimes you're being led astray or mm -hmm. being let down, or it's not what you want. Mm -hmm. And you're going to, you're probably going to look for something somebody or some other clergy or church that's mm -hmm. going to provide your needs. Yeah, or something that's totally outside of a uh, yes. uh, faith community. I love that uh, word, you know, mention of shepherd because that's exactly, I mean, the word pastoral comes yes. from that, uh, being the, the the pastor of the, uh, the flock. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the bishop's crozier mm -hmm. is... Uh, used for that reason, just as shepherds used the, the, in, uh, especially in the Holy Land area, but a, anywhere, I suppose, uh, the, the, the staff had uh, two uh, main functions to it. One is the uh, crooked end on it, the staff and the crook, as it's often referred to, and the purpose of that was to, you know, with uh, the lambs or sheep was running off, going from the flock, the shepherd uh, turned it that way and hooked them around the neck yeah. and hauled them back into the fold. Keep the community together. Yes. And uh, if they were lagging behind and uh, tending to drift off, then he used the long end of it to give them a, a, a guidance or a route along, we might say, by a smack on the back legs or on the, the back side or what have you, to mm -hmm. nudge them to stay together. So that guiding and protecting and uh, unifying all parts of it, indeed. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Thanks for the comment. Any other comment or thought or idea? Anything from you, Neil? Get your microphone working now. Okay, I don't think Neil has his mic for working. Uh, I always, 
I feel that many are called to ministry, but it's a difference between lay ministry and ordained ministry. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's very simple. Mm -hmm. The ordained ministry is, we've talked about the, you know, recognizing that in that quote, when God is bringing any do it, does it gradually. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Bishop Jeff and I had an interesting conversation a while ago because he's always nudging that I should consider mm -hmm. ordained ministry. And I keep telling him that God hasn't called me to organ ministry. Mm -hmm. He's called me to lay ministry. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the big difference. It's something that some of us, and what it, like, you know, the Shepherd Allard analogy was so good. There's, there's certain of us that, well, how he had made, mm -hmm. it's that, that in that gift, that, that piece to do. And it, so, I mean, many of us would choose to, to be helpers and minister in ways whether it's through our paid employment of social work or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think when the ordained piece is something that's there, and I think a lot of people even try to ignore it, mm -hmm. but when it's there, and it, it makes that difference. And, yeah. I, and I, think I'm, I think I would never totally understand it unless I felt it, because mm -hmm. that's how I work. Yeah. But I, I see mm -hmm. there's, there's a difference, and it's something yeah. to me that comes from inside that when, when he made us. Yes, yeah. yeah. And you know, important in it is that we are all called. Yeah. There's no such thing as someone yeah. not being called. Yeah. But the discernment is called to what? Yeah. And in, in, in when it comes to ministry, it's you know, what way should I be active in the church as a lay person or as a deacon or as a priest? Sad thing is, the vast majority don't hear any call or they don't respond to any call. You know, right back to William James, you know, if people only thought about it for a little bit, it would lead them to action, the action would lead to, to other things that would, you know, be part of discerning, what should I be doing as a, a Christian person, yeah. you know. One of the things that I believe an ordained person brings is they invoke the presence of God yeah. you know, through, through a spirit. Mm -hmm. And by their, their presence, in a room or their willingness to talk about God in a very open way mm. um, instead of dealing on the periphery of different issues you know just the mm. uh, symptoms mm. uh, there's a very great depth of conversation mm. that takes place yeah and because most people don't talk about the spirit mm -hmm. most people don't talk about their faith yeah and mm. yet um, in one of my conversations we don't talk about the weather. No. You know, we yeah. can talk about where, where God is leading them yeah. and uh, mm. where God is leading us. Yeah. yeah. And and that, I think, is different from a doctor or a nurse yeah. or a social yeah. worker. Oh, indeed. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. You know, that it's explicit. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Not shy about it in one way or another. And discreet is when and how to do it. Okay. Let's push on. Uh, and... and, and a few more items that might be of interest. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, says St. Paul in Romans, he says, but it's a matter of justice, peace, and joy, the Holy Spirit. You know, we, we hear much talk in Scripture references to what is the kingdom of God? Or, or, you know, talking about it, but actually that's the only verse of Scripture that gives a description of what the kingdom of God is, or gives a definition. And St. Paul says it's a matter of justice, peace, and joy. You know, if we were to look at it, because this is what, when it's all said and done, it's what we're all called to, isn't it? Or lay people and ordained in any ministries, whether it's deacon, priest, or bishop, we're all called to be building the kingdom of God. And how we can assess that for ourselves or others when we have a role to be helping and guiding them, whether it's parents guiding children by what they say or by what they do, leading by example, or teachers guiding their children or pastors guiding their, their parishioners or uh, field supervisors and support teams uh, guiding a, an intern. When it's all said and done, what we're looking at is, is, is this building the kingdom of God? And so how we decide that is, is it about justice? You know, is, is there fairness in it? Is there concern for the vulnerable? That's a really important part. That's the, the, the critical issue. 
you know, is what we are doing as a parish, is the, the uh, focus of this uh, uh, person who's preparing for ministry, uh, does it take into consideration the needs of those who are vulnerable, whether the sick or the shut-ins or the alienated or the underprivileged or the homeless or the uh, poor or the widows and orphans or uh, the addicts or others, including the lonely? You know, does the person, by their attitudes and their actions, care about uh, about those who are not being treated fairly, we might say, or aren't getting the same advantages of life and of community, including faith community as others? Is this person about peace? And, and the ministry of peace is about being able to live with and work with others in harmonious relationships and bring about reconciliation. Bring about reconciliation. Those who for whatever reasons, driving wages are not building the kingdom of God. It's just not how it can be done. The kingdom of God is about justice and about peace and joy. Is there joy in it? The joy of the gospel, does it resonate in the words and the deeds of any of us and all of us? This is not only about interns, but it's about all of us, isn't it? Uh, it's going to shift a little bit now and talk about the variety of roles that are there in the um, in the, the internship. And um, one thing that we look at is the role in the relationship between the field supervisor and the intern. Uh, there's a work evaluation and there's instruction and it's kind of an apprenticeship where the person is on the ground doing work, learning the, the trade, we might say, or the profession and the character of, uh, of the profession. They'll get training, sometimes by specific instruction, often by example, and then being able to practice it under supervision before they do it on their own. The uh, field supervisor is a resource to the person uh, by answering their questions or by uh, going to them to consult if they are preparing themselves for a visit or a follow-up visit with somebody that they found themselves kind of unsettled by the last time. You know, you went to visit someone and the person starts to tell them about an incident that happened in their life or uh, loss of someone by suicide or that it's an elderly person and uh, in the process of just having a chat with them they tell about uh, having a, a miscarriage uh, you know 75 years ago and when the person starts to tell it they're talking about it almost as if it's happened a week ago you know and those are not uncommon things for people in ministry to come across well our internships you know uh, can go to their pastor to as a resource and a consultant, you know, what should I do? How should I handle this? Is this normal? Is this common? And what have you. One of the biggest mistakes, of course, that sometimes people going out in any profession will make is thinking that they have to be able to, uh, you know, deal with every issue and problem that could ever uh, come before them. And, and none of us are able to do that. So it's uh, uh, important that they be aware that they ought to go to their pastor for some advice on, on how to handle sometimes difficult situations. Uh, and the, the uh, pastor, the field supervisor can be kind of guiding the um, student in, in matters spiritual, not as a spiritual director, but as a, to be aware of the spiritual dimensions of so many things and how to be aware of the spiritual dimension when you're doing your pastoral ministry and connecting with people and uh, uh, especially in the early years of someone's ministry uh, as they're getting into their internship preparing to move on into further ordination to be uh, able to uh, have that presence amongst the faith community an important thing, and I suppose this is a yardstick, we'll be looking for feedback from you as a members of the support team uh, on, you know, 
what do you think of this person? How, how are they going to make out? And you know, that can be a big, complicated question to ask, but I've boiled it down to these three things, kind of when all else is said and done, when you're sitting in on the, the session and the intern asks you for feedback or, uh, or, uh, or seeking uh, pilling to ask you for feedback or you're putting, doing up an evaluation at the tail end of it, you're wondering, you know, how is this person going to make out? These are three simple questions that they could give you a pretty good idea of what you will think of a fellow that's, uh, that's going to be with you or the lady who's going to be with you, depending on where you are. You can ask yourself simply, are you inspired by what this person preached about the word of God? Is, is, is this person able to inspire? Do they make the gospel sound good news, bad news? What type of news is it? Or is there any news is it in it? Is it only humdrum? Are you comfortable with what that person would uh, teach your children or grandchildren or other youth about God? Because remember, they're, what these people are is preparing for leadership role for the next generation of the church. And would you want that person at your bed, at your deathbed, or deathbed of a loved one, we might say, if you're critically ill? In other words, would that person bring you a sense of joy and comfort and consolation and relief or reconciliation? Or would you figure, oh, God, it frightened the death out of me if I, uh, well, frightened death out of you mightn't be bad if you're, uh, <laughs> if you're dying, but frightened life out of you. <laughs> Any comments, questions, observations? What other kinds of things come to your mind that you, you think uh, need to be kept in mind as, uh, as you're moving into an experience with, uh, with students? Neil, you still there? We able to hear you? I'm not getting you, my man. Uh, you know, I think there's a good thing to be a part of this team. Uh, <clears throat> seeing those three questions up there. Uh, one time, when we're talking about respect and so on, and what made the ordained minister different and apart from other professions, helping professions. Mm -hmm. and, Okay. We're getting you back, but you can turn off your uh, <laughs> turn off your mic now. You got to, you must have two computers going, do you? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to get in on another one. No? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Which one are you on? You're live on yours. <laughs> Hold on, now this one's gone. <laughs> Lee. Okay. I think we, I think uh, my wife bailed me out. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to have you. Now I'm back. There we go. Glad to have you back. Good. Good. What you were saying? Yeah. Um, one oh, I wouldn't say nothing. I just said my wife bailed me out. That's all. Oh yeah. Okay. But here in the room. Uh, one time the the ordained ministers were well. They were next to God, and everybody, you know, they got respect whether they earned it or not. They mm -hmm. were respected. Yeah. yeah. And I see it now, someone new coming into the ministry for ordination. They got a hard road ahead of them because they got to earn the respect. Yeah. Yeah. It's not taken for granted. The, the, yeah. In the past, um, a lot of those clergy, some of those clergy, took advantage of the position they were in and the trust and the respect that they were mm. given. Yeah. And as a result of that, they lost it all. Mm. So yeah. now someone coming into the ordained ministry now, they got the honor. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I see that as being, uh, being part of this team as someone saying, well, you know, what do I want this one? Yeah. 
teaching my grandchildren. I would have wanted them around my grandchildren. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. that strikes a call with everyone here in the room. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Would you yeah. want someone that you feel that is not suitable teaching your grandchildren? That's right, yeah. Or being in their presence? Yeah. 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 I wouldn't. No, no, no. I mean, that is a... And there's a caution in all professions, isn't it? But as much in uh, in ministry as as anywhere now, you know. And like you say, it, it wasn't always that way. I don't, you know, my observation, having worked with people in many denominations, you know, most clergy don't mind that. In fact, they're kind of quite willing to take on that uh, challenge of, uh, you know, having to prove themselves because they're they're up to it, mm. you know. And most are not a bit shy about. Uh, you know, being who they are and doing what they do. And they're glad to have something separate those of good character from those who are, uh, who are uh, exploiting it and what have you. The unfortunate thing, of course, in our context in Newfoundland, uh, probably as much or more than anywhere else, is that uh, unfortunately there's been so much uh, happened, particularly sexual abuse uh, issues, that sometimes uh, people don't even give you a chance to prove yourself. They're, you're written off before you ever say or do anything that's right. and that's unfortunate not only for the clergy's sake i mean they will do what they do and, and, and do it. but it's unfortunate for those people and their children and their families that because you know they're really putting you know a wedge in there themselves that uh, doesn't need to be there but it's unfortunate but it's it's not without reason is it you know people have been severely hurt but yeah what you're saying is correct and so it's a wonderful time to be part of a team like this and be able to guide someone to yeah. be aware of how, uh, you know, they, their actions and behaviors and so on can be seen. You know, it's not only about protection of children either. It's uh, the overall credibility of the church, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. 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 Any other thoughts or comments before we start to look in at the manual for a few moments? Okay, what I'm going to do, and those who are online probably have their own copies uh, uh, printed by now, but I printed copies for those who are here. I'll mention again that I'll be distributing the uh, the uh, epistles. Uh, that I'll be distributing the slides to you, but uh, the the manual uh, that we use for the uh, internship program is. Uh, Fairly comprehensive. Don't be intimidated by the size of it. I want to pay attention, draw attention to the fact that on the screen there, the last 40 pages of uh, 101 pages <laughs> are uh, forms, lots of forms. I'll mention now, it'll come up on the slide later, but the students are the ones who are responsible for all the forms. You, as the team, might have to, will you complete one halfway through the term, you'll complete one at the end, and then you'll also do an evaluation of the program for us. Uh, the uh, pastor completes uh, a couple of others along the way, but the intern takes the responsibility to make the copies, to distribute them, to get them, done, get them to you, and all that kind of stuff. That's part of the learning experience for them. And the accountability part of ministry as well. So uh, we expect them to uh, to do that, and uh, and and we remind <coughs> them of the importance of doing it and sticking with the schedule. I had a session with the students yesterday, the interns, and and uh, uh, you know explained that to them uh, again. Uh, they they're after getting this stuff for me so often they haven't learned it all. But still, they'll come back and say, "Oh, I never heard that before." Well, <laughs> it wasn't because it wasn't said to you. I did that lots of times when I was a student, so this batch are not unique, I assure you. Just so when you've been a student as long and as often as I have, you know all the tricks of the trade and you know how to <laughs> stay step ahead of it. Uh, these days, in fact, so much stuff is transacted on email that, you know, I was going to say, look, I sent you this on the uh, 15th of March. Uh, so how can you say you never heard it before? Oh, I must have deleted it. Now that's serious <laughs> trouble. <laughs> It's that's like saying, well, I didn't listen to you. I turned you off. So anyway, the manual has uh, has uh, a lot of forms in it. And it also has what we, we did for the sake of helping everyone to understand and better appreciate the, the program, because it is a program, supervised pastoral internship 
program. So there are a variety of people and components to it, all set up to achieve a, a common goal. But uh, we wanted to make sure that everyone had access to what the others were doing. So the first part of the manual is a general introduction to the internship program, the first few pages, and it's a good overview for anyone who wants to have a quick look at it and some of the foundations of it. The second part looks at the role for field supervisors and things they can do and need to do and what have you. We'll have a quick look at that in a few moments. And then there's stuff there for the support team that we'll have some uh, a bit of a look at as well from around page 39 onward. And then uh, the last part is the information for the interns, which I went over with them in great detail yesterday again. Um, so the overall introduction to it, and I, I assure you I'm not going to go to this word for word, page by page and so on, but uh, it does... Uh, uh, draw and on top of page five, draw out some, uh, you know, just to be aware of overall what it is. So it has four primary purposes to integrate theology, theoretical learning, and field experience, to develop and refine skills, experience, and pers perspectives appropriate to ministerial competence, to aid in the process of clarifying one's identity with an emerging ministerial identity and to deepen Christian commitment. And those things dovetail very much into what I see to be the foundations or the pillars on which we operate Queen's College. I'd like to, to emphasize that we are about good theological education. We're about pastoral practice and skills. Uh, people have a theoretical and theological knowledge, but they also know how to minister to people effectively that it is about spiritual development and that is an important component an important resource that makes ministry christianity and especially ordained ministry different than other undertakings that there is a spiritual component the life of christ and life in christ is essential to it and how we Establish and sustain that for ourselves is so important. So for students, we require them to have a spiritual director and those types of things and what have you. And the fourth component, along with good theological education, pastoral skills and practice, spiritual component, is what we call a faith-based community of learning. That people come together with others to talk about the things that they're studying or the skills that they're practicing the things they're doing. So they talk about it in the context of faith. So they develop the language to be able to talk about, uh, about what they believe and that they are in a context where they're not only with people who are going to sit and listen to them as when they're preaching Sunday morning, but they're in a situation where they're able to debate and discuss, argue, some might say, so that they have their own thoughts and ideas put to the test enough to be able to hear themselves say things that are probably right and true and clever or pure nonsense that when they say it, they almost hear themselves saying, okay, that sounds crazier than it did when I was thinking it. <laughs> that sometimes happens as well. So that's a faith-based community of learning gives people the opportunity to be with others for discussion and debate and, and what have you. Um, so the, the manual goes on and gives more description of how things are done and the methods that are used in it and uh, all of those things. And, and, and this is what we're expected to do, of course, as a, uh, an organization as part of the Association of Theological Schools, which is the big accrediting agency for theological schools. And in order for our students to be able to take courses and uh, transfer them to other places and vice versa, we have to keep up the standard that they have at other places uh, uh, for the same type of, uh, of work. And so uh, uh, these are, this is how we do it in this case, at least. Uh, so it lays out uh, details there and responsibilities of different people. And so you can have a leaf, a leaf through that at your own uh, uh, time and leisure, we might say. Uh, 
The second part that we come to there is uh, the role of the field supervisor. And uh, I think, David, you had, uh, you've had uh, students in the past, haven't you? So you're quite familiar with Neil. Uh, I think this is a new venture for you, isn't it? I see Neil got his mic on, but I'm still not hearing him. Okay, not getting you Neil, but I know from our previous conversations that uh, it's something new for you, and uh, Neil is actually doing the uh, uh, course that we have on in supervision for ministry uh, this year because of his uh, interest in, in doing this and for other purposes as well. So uh, the section in the manual from page 21 onward uh, lays out what... Okay, yes, Neil, we can hear you now. Yeah, I had to take the speakers out, so I'm only listening to you now through my uh, speaker and my computer. Yeah, oh. this is the first time for me being a uh, supervisor of an intern. The only dealings I have with this is when I was an intern at St. Mark's in 2002. Oh, yeah. 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 So it's a, a good while ago, but uh, some of it is, uh, I mean, essentially it's, what an internship would be. I know it's steadily uh, being revised, but uh, the real essence of it uh, continue to to be very much the same. Uh, so the the uh, supervisor section uh, gives a, a lot of good uh, descriptions on the kinds of roles that a supervisor has, how they might want to do it, and make some suggestions on things that they can do if they want to. You know, mix it up for their own sake, and uh, and the students. When I say by mix it up, I mean you know ways of being able to uh, get feedback and dialogue. They might use case studies, or they might uh, get students to do up a verbatim report on something they're doing, and those kinds of things. Or they might prefer to uh, simply, uh, and I say simply, but more usually most effective to have interview sessions with the uh, student on. Uh, on what they're doing. One of the things that we do is we ask the field supervisors to have a scheduled meeting uh, with uh, the student each week. Now, every field supervisor and student will be together going places and meeting in church and meeting at meetings and those kinds of things, having conversations as they're coming and going, what have you. That's uh, a part of it and of course essential to it as well. Uh, the same as in, in any other context where uh, people are working together in a team. Uh, but we also ask that they arrange a meeting for the purpose of supervision once a week for at least an hour. So that, you know, from 9 to 10 on Wednesday morning or what have you, that's when we sit down and we formally look at, you know, what your goals are, how you seem to be making progress with it. Uh, last week when you did this that or the other thing, we thought that, uh, you know, this is what you yourself thought you might want to do differently or what I suggested you do differently, or this is what the support team suggests you ought to be doing differently. You know, how's that going? Are you making the changes with it? Or now, you know, you told me you thought you needed to change this. I told you I thought you needed to change that. Support team thought you needed to change that, but nothing has changed. How come? You know, right? And so you need that time that clearly starts, this is the start of our, you know, feedback session or, or, or established time. And, and that usually works best. Sometimes people, you know, they're together quite a bit and they chat about things on the go, but then on the tail end of it, sometimes both the supervisor and the uh, intern regret that they didn't have a more formal time to get together and, and discuss things and, and keep a focus. So that's uh, the field supervisor's role. I'm not going to belabor it anymore if either uh, uh, Reverend Neil or Erstick and uh, uh, David have uh, questions, you know where I am. Uh, but I suspect that both of your ways of skinning the cat will be just as effective or more effective than mine because you're out there where it matters and you have a, a good idea of how to give a student the experience that they need and sometimes to be able to suggest to them that there's things you need exposure to. It's not in your learning goals. It's not in anything you've identified for us. But by gosh, you know, you really need to crack at this because uh, you're going to come up against it so often and you haven't even thought of it. So uh, 
you know, add that to it as well. That's one of the advantages, of course, the students uh, identify, uh, you know, work on their learning goals. Uh, they're all doing some work on those now. But when they go to their parishes next week, one of the first things they'll be doing is discussing the learning goals with uh, the field supervisor to make sure they're realistic and that there's some reasonable hope that they can get exposure to those things or learn to do those things or test those things while they're in that particular parish. And uh, so uh, uh, that'll be part of the uh, discussions in the very first days when people arrive uh, on the scene. Um, and then there are the wonderful people that are the intern support teams. And so uh, that uh, section is from page 38 uh, onto about page 60 or so in the manual. And it uh, essentially lays out what the, uh, what the intern support team does and how they'll do it. In a few moments, I'm going to, uh, and I hope you heard that, I said in a few moments. Well, not much longer than that. Uh, I'm going to put on a video that gives a little bit of a description of uh, an intern support team and some discussions. And uh, we're only going to watch the introduction part of that video tonight, but I have copies of it to give to you uh, so that you can take it. And probably in your first meeting, you might watch it. The total video is only about 40 minutes or so, but it uh, goes to some of the different tasks that are uh, part of the typical uh, role and responsibility of the intern support team. Uh, if we just look at the uh, the manual, and obviously uh, both uh, all of the field supervisors, the pastors in the parishes where the students are going, have been very diligent in selecting uh, good representatives of the parish. You know, trying to get a cross section of uh, of uh, parishioners to participate in the team. Right at the start of it, we have to acknowledge that not everybody's going to be able to be available for every meeting, and that's fine. Don't worry about that, you know. But together, you'll all be able to contribute. The second thing that's uh, often uh, worthwhile is to decide right up front uh, who is going to act as the chair or the chairperson of the, uh, of the support team. Typically, what happens is that the field supervisor and the team will meet with the student within the first couple of weeks, either in the first week or the second week that they're there, to sit down and to watch that video, to talk about their roles, and to get things organized. But to make that happen, uh, usually you need someone to take the lead in setting up that first meeting. Because after the first meeting, the pastor, the field supervisor, won't be at the support team meetings. Because the, the purpose of the support team is to be a place where the student can bring their learning goals, their learning covenant, and uh, talk about how they feel they're doing with them. And uh, you will be able to provide feedback for them. For instance, somebody, let's use the example of uh, they go to a parish and uh, they they say you know I'm not uh, I've never done parish visitation and uh, I, I don't like the idea of just going and visiting people in their homes you know I'm not comfortable with it because I'm a shy person they might say and uh, I feel that's being a bit intrusive on people to do that but parish visitation is a very important part of parish ministry and keeping people connected and reaching out and giving witness and those types of things. So as the person is getting into their work, you know, by the time they're there for a couple of weeks and then for a month and up to six weeks and so on, they need to be able to, you know, the pastor has been helping them to get into, bringing them on some visitations themselves, other than sick or to shut-ins or to families that are having a child baptized or uh, just uh, the routine door-to-door -door type of visitation. So they will show what they do and what have you. And then it comes time for the intern to uh, take over and start doing some visitation on their own. And uh, so the, the idea then of the intern support, that the intern will be able to tell you how that's going and uh, how they're finding it. 
but you yourselves might be after being visited in your home or somebody belong to you might say, well, the intern was lying to came to visit or, uh, you know, be able to describe to you uh, what their experience of that, vis uh, that visit was and those kinds of things. Uh, and, and it'd be an opportunity for if the person continued to be hesitant about doing visitation uh, to be able to help them to understand why it is an important part of ministry and what have you. Or they might uh, have something about preaching, or it might be something about working with youth, or, uh, you know, a variety of things. And they might also have issues on, on you know, like uh, how their relationship is going with their uh, field supervisor. And so the idea of having the support team is an opportunity for the team uh, to meet with the uh, student uh, and let them you know, have uh, open conversation and for you to be able to provide feedback and advice to them on, uh, you know, things they can do to hopefully prepare, improve uh, their, their way of uh, ministering or to get better practice at it or whatever the case might be. So it'd be important to get the team kind of set up right. Uh, uh, well, the team is already set up, but to get the, the kind of uh, organization of it in place so that somebody takes the role to be the uh, uh, the chair of the team because if you rely on the pastor though the pastor is not going to be at those meetings and so then if there's a need to change it or what have you uh, you know you're not going to be there and what have, it doesn't take very long I mean the intern's only with you for till the end of November so if it's slow getting started and then it goes off track and you can't get the group back together before you know it, the internship is over and the team hasn't really been able to be part of it the way that they, they need to be and the way that we need uh, it to be. And has anybody yet uh, been selected to be the chair or uh, volunteered or uh, you have someone in mind? I have someone in mind. Okay, yes. perfect. So, yeah, that's good. Uh, we'll leave it with your capable hands because I know it's going to be done. <laughs> Thank you. And Neil, same with yourself. Uh, is there someone uh, uh, designated yet as the uh, lead for the, the team? No, but I got a rough idea of who's going to be. Okay, good, good. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure that person is going to get a rough idea pretty soon, too. <laughs> I, I'd say the guy's respected already. <laughs> yeah, and that's good. That's good. That's good. So if you just want to look through the stuff on the uh, the team there, in case you have other questions or it kind of lays it out, and the the chairperson will be able to kind of have a closer look at it because it kind of shows how the role of the team likely goes a bit deeper as they move to the first month and then second month and the third month and so on it's described on page 42 and so uh, the we've had good uh, good feedback from the uh, uh, teams other years that uh, they say they found the manual to be quite helpful in uh, understanding what the purpose of it is about and how to go about it and uh, and, and what have you yeah Reverend Sam gave me a copy I read it for a game pretty to me it's pretty simple like, yeah you know, like, the month one two, like it's yeah it's there what you need to do and yeah and, and how to go about it the big, yeah. You're right. The big thing is getting organized at the gate and getting started. Because if not, the next thing you're trying to do, yeah, you never got done because you missed the date, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so there's even some questions and answers. Uh, there uh, are frequently asked questions. We might say on page 47. So that helps it. Uh... My thing is the intern is expecting this to happen too, so I wouldn't want to let them down. That's right. They, they, yeah. They've seen this and they're. They're expecting they're going somewhere and they're going to get this support. That's right. So, yeah. 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 I have not saying that all saints do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have no doubt that it's going to happen there. That's, uh... well, folks, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put on for a few moments a, uh, a video uh, mm -hmm. that's about uh, this matter of intern support teams. Neil, you'll be able to tell us if you, uh, if you can see it or not when I uh, put it on. One of the greatest gifts offered to us in our faith life is the opportunity to be in community with each other. Within community, we are able to learn and grow in faith, sharing joys and sorrows. In this spirit of community learning, this video will highlight an important aspect in the formation of a ministry student, the local committee. I can see it. 
the local committee is a representative. Uh, Neil, can you hear that? Oh, yeah, that's good, yeah. And can you see it? Yeah. Perfect, good. Group of lay people dedicated to the ministry and mission of the church who offer support and challenge to a ministry student. A local committee is created in order to assist a ministry student to grow personally, theologically, and vocationally as they embark on a new part of their journey of faith. I want to take this opportunity to welcome each of you to this local committee. I especially want to welcome Kathy, our student who will be with us for the next nine months. And I want to also uh, indicate to you how thrilled I am that each of you agreed to serve on this committee. It's a particular kind of committee. My name is Arnie. I'm minister at this congregation. And this evening I will be facilitating our process here. At this point in time, we just want to introduce ourselves. And I think we'll sort of go around the circle and we'll let Kathy introduce herself uh, uh, last. So why don't we begin over here? My name is Yoon Hee. Uh, I'm Kim from South Korea. So I'd like to share my experience from my country in this country too. Hi, Kathy. I'm Kevin. And uh, you usually find me in the children's department downstairs on Sunday mornings playing with the kids. And uh, I also do some ministry with some seniors communities in the city. I'm Blair, and I've been at this church for 18 years now. Um, and I spend most of my time in the youth group of the church, sometimes in the services. I just watch. There was one time when I uh, got to actually perform a sermon. That was quite fun. I'm Bessie. I've been in the church forever, about 51 years. And I'm pastoral care chair. And I'm very interested in being on this committee because a few years ago, we did have a student in our church, and I worked quite closely with her because she was interested in pastoral care. So this time I wanted to be involved in this part of it, so I'm here to learn. Hi, Kathy. Welcome. I'm Jean, and I'm so lucky to have Bessie here as my mentor. <laughs> I've been uh, a part of this church for 11 years, and I'm active uh, in the Native Solidarity Circle, and I'm on council. In fact, uh, in next week we'll become the chair of council so we'll be working closely together i'm sure with arnie and i'm really looking forward to that thank you and finally kathy i'm jan and i'm another one of bessie's mentees i work with her on the uh, pastoral care committee you and keep driving this bessie but i do i do and it's a pleasure and i'm part of outreach and then this year i had the privilege of being part of a a group like this with Barney and some other members of the congregation and uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the growth experience of this so welcome thank you and Kathy we'll let you introduce yourself I'm Kathy and a student in finished my first year in a four-year program in ministry uh, very much appreciative of the fact that you folks have agreed to walk with me and journey with me in my ministry and my education especially the educational part of the ministry program. So. Part of uh, the local committee's responsibility is to share in supervision. Uh, as minister here in this congregation, I will be supervising Kathy from that perspective. But I'm convinced that being a minister in the congregation also means that we have to learn how to listen to the laity and what it is that the laity have to offer to help us identify uh, the fullness of ministry, the richness of ministry, uh, the challenges of ministry. And so one of the purposes of this committee is to reflect with Kathy on what she's experiencing and to help her uh, appreciate how it is that we're experiencing ministry, not just her ministry, but our ministry with one another. So one of the purposes of the committee is to explore how it is that we are participants with Kathy and Kathy with us in making sure that ministry here is of a high quality. And so I'm thrilled that Bessie and Jan uh, have already served on previous committees because you can help us identify what it is that you experienced there and bring that forward here. So one of the purposes of the committee is that we will provide support for Kathy. And another uh, responsibility is that we will challenge you in terms of what, what uh, some assumptions might be that you carry with you in ministry. We'll also ask you to challenge us 
and to help us grow. And so it's a constant give and take. So supervision is really that growing into a living relationship with one another. And so we also want to make sure that uh, we share with Kathy that whole sense of we're in ministry together. And laity have as much to offer in ministry as clergy, and clergy have as much to offer as laity. It's almost like we're going on an adventure, like we're, we're on this, this path, but we bring different perspectives and experiences and, you know, be able to support one another in our, in our journey. So that's mm -hmm. going to be really exciting. Now, maybe you have some questions that you want to ask in terms of the committee or in terms of the process, uh, or we might be asking Kathy some questions or you might have some questions of us. Are there such questions? Uh, well, you had mentioned, Arnie, that you won't be uh, attending most of the meetings. So I, I'm just from a process point of view, do we kind of elect a chairperson or somebody to, to, to lead, or is that something Kathy will do, or do we take turns, or just process-wise? Yeah, what do you think? What do you think? Do you think it would be good to have a chairperson? I'm up on sitting not to the side of the no, chairperson of council. I wasn't volunteering. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe since it's a learning journey for all of us, it would make sense to kind of uh, rotate it yes. and and yeah, and, they, and have and has people act, you know, for a meeting those who are comfortable more, perhaps as a facilitator mm -hmm. than, yeah. than a kind of a yeah. Yeah. chair. Like we're all sharing yeah, the process exactly. together. Exactly, but I just think we kind of need to have somebody who's going to pick up the ball at the end of the meeting as you did. Yeah. I think either possibility could work. One is that uh, uh, as a committee you uh, elect uh, a chairperson or you rotate it and uh, keep in mind that in that sense then everybody's going to get an opportunity to serve as chair. Yeah, we've always got to be enough place in the meeting for Kathy to have Per se, because otherwise some of us can talk an awful lot, could drown her out. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, Kathy, I'm sure for, uh, some of our get togethers will be assuming a leadership role. So I have, you know, yeah. to, to kind of guide us and uh, practice that kind of stuff. And the training for when she get into the real trenches yeah. of ministry. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I have a very different experience in Korea, right? Mm -hmm. Then but, uh, can I give you a big challenge? to apply my experience to you, mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah. yeah. it's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. I mean, you have to remember too, with Kathy as a student, she's got a lot more theology inside her than, for instance, I have. Mm -hmm. And that would be really good for all of us to have Kathy's experience here. Kathy, I'd like to say she has a different experience of ministry, but not necessarily less or more. All right, I'll buy that. Yeah. How about you? Any questions you have of the process? No, but I mean, I would like to have the opportunity to facilitate and and also be in a committee where others are facilitating as well and be and be a part of that process. And yes, I will have some specific learning goals that I have set for myself mm -hmm. that I'll bring to it, and then also to have the learning goals that, that the committee or this uh, local That's committee puts together for themselves. Yeah. Would that be a good agenda item for the next meeting? Because you're going to address the whole sense of learning contract yeah. at the next meeting, and it would, I think, be helpful if for Kathy, we would say to her, these are some of our learning goals. These are some of our expectations of you. Yeah. And maybe we need, each need to go away and think about that a little bit between now and the next meeting yeah. in, in terms now that we've kind of got the basis of what our mandate is and what we're hoping to do together. From my own experience, having supervised a number of students, I've learned that it is helpful for me to also identify my learning goals. And I've found it's been helpful for committee members to do the same. So I want to affirm uh, that uh, wish on your part, Kathy. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's where we will close off uh, this evening, is to explore sort of with one another, what is it in ministry that I consider very important for me? I think that will give us a chance to kind of think through the goals that we might have for ourselves and be able to respond then to the goals that Kathy has. 
So they, this video goes on with several different sections. I'll just show you the, the first little bit of the second In scripture, one. God makes a covenant with us saying, I will be your God and you will be my people. Similarly, the Learning Covenant outlines a written agreement with the student that is rooted in faith. This Learning Covenant outlines times for meeting, goals, and tasks, as well as a conflict resolution process. While a student may begin this contextual learning with some general learning goals, the supervisor and local committee will help to flesh out these goals in more detail. The local committee is not required to develop its own learning goals. However, as lifelong learners, members may enjoy outlining individual or group learning goals for exploration. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Okay. So uh, I'll give you a copy. I'll give it to you, David, and uh, then you'll have it as a committee. As the, the video itself can be a good uh, uh, discussion uh, starter for the team when they meet for their first session and get a sense of what it is that we're doing and what is you know a bit of review on what notion of the learning covenant is and so on because by that time uh students and the supervisors will likely have uh, have uh, started to do some work on it and, and what have you but as was suggested in the video i think it is good for the committee also to think you know okay so the student comes to us with some thoughts and ideas and the pastor will help them hone those and make sense of of what it is that the student has in mind but then the field supervisor has a lifetime of experience or at least a lot of experience in in ministry practical ministry fellows like reverend neil and arstic and pillings and all the others around the uh, the province who have we have seven interns out this semester and um uh, but then yourselves you know there's a chance for you to be able to say you know we think that someone getting ready to take on a pastoral leadership role in church needs to is a bit of this, that, and the other thing. So you can, you know, name that as well for a student to work on. Because that's what it's about. We're all in this together. And uh, so it'll be a great opportunity to help the person be really equipped to take on type of leadership that you, from your own life experiences, figure is the, uh, what the church needs for the future. And uh, that's where we have to try and, and uh, make people ready for, isn't it? One thing that I saw there, I only saw two or three people under 50. Mm. Yeah. In the congregation. The congregation <laughs> and the, the yeah. team there was only two under 50 there. The teens that, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's the way it is, isn't it? In most places. You know. Why is it? Well, I wish we had a quick, you know, I doubt there's one single answer to solution to that. You know, there uh, seems to be a lot of a lot of uh, excuse me uh, a lot of factors that make it that way but i wish i knew the single thing that leads it you know there certainly seems to be a substantial cultural gap between the church as we have known it and the external world and the challenge to try and be relevant in that world is uh, is certainly one that's I think uh, some churches are coming to it now to try and take, uh, you know, to, but I hope it's not too late, you know. Maybe they're trusting God too, I don't think that, uh, you know, things can come around and change. And I suppose some of the things that have changed were probably things that needed to change as well. But a lot of it we have to wait out, wait out and see what the outcome will be. Um, hmm. You know, uh, for myself, I asked all of you to be part of part of the team for a reason. You know, one, because in my prayers, your names popped into my mind, your faces popped into my mind. I saw each of you bringing something different to the table, and each of you having a different perspective of the church that we we, we call home, and and I wanted our intern to experience a wide variety uh, of, and that's why each of you were, were selected, because I don't want to present to Reverend John a oneness, you know, 
All Saints is made up of a whole bunch of us saints, and there's seven of us here right now. Mm -hmm. And um, and I want 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 Reverend John to experience that through through our group and mm -hmm. uh, um, and the variety, not the sameness, is the strength of this committee in my mind. That's great, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions or comments or suggestions regarding the uh, regarding the team? What its role or function is, a lot of it is addressed and explained in the manual, but it's a chance to have a, a chat about it here if anyone has anything else to inquire about. Well, when I went to uh, get the team that I put together, and I guess I had to say they're all hand selected. I give some people opportunities to come on board, but it didn't reciprocate. So I handpicked four people to come on to, on the team. And again, that's what I looked at is their, you know, discernment and their role in life of where they've journeyed. And uh, I guess <laughs> I just graduated to the bracket of there's probably no one under 50 on the team I've got selected either. <laughs> because I just graduated to that now myself. So, yeah. but uh, like I said, I don't have the answers either. Why we don't have what we have, but uh, what I always say is when I when I hear those, you know, where are the people too? And I've said it to my bishop, and I think I even said it to the primate on one occasion, is that I'm more than happy with those who we have because we have a solid foundation. And if we, you know, if we open up to our God as a store for us, I think we can only build on that foundation. And this is why, as as supervisors and as people now who are uh, being on this committee, we're mentors to someone going out, uh, like we said a few moments ago, uh, in a, in a position not as privileged as it once was. So you know, they need that strength. They need to know they have that support in us. Uh, when they're venturing out into those uh, uncharted territories. Uh, as much as I get disheartened, I, I thank God every day that we do still have that foundation on which we can continue to build. Great, thanks. Aaron, the from the Any other comments or suggestions? Okay, let's uh, flick for the last uh, few items here, so we don't keep you longer than you need to. So the um, next section of the manual has the information for the interns. They'll uh, move through that on their own. And then uh, there's a uh, uh, the, the section from page 60, 61 onward has all of the uh, uh, forms. You'll see that there are lots of forms there, uh, evaluations and observation sheets and all of those kinds of things. So uh, the intern is the one responsible to make sure the forms get distributed and to the people that need to complete them and that they get them back to us and, and those kinds of things. Um, there are a few special issues and they're really on the last couple of pages of it that we just include. I'm not going to go into any uh, major uh, detail on those, but some matters that we felt that needed to be uh, uh, in the manual and types of matters that will need some attention as time goes along. And so there's a short section there on financial matters, but essentially our interns are students and they have whatever financial arrangements that were put in place for their, uh, uh, by their diocese and their uh, themselves to fund their uh, their, their uh, education and uh, so both by diocesan policies and uh, uh, students own uh, means they that covers their finances in some instances some parishes are in a situation to be able to give students a small honorarium of some sort and what have you and so uh, those are things they work out uh, themselves, but there isn't an obligation to do that. Uh, the internship is really like any other semester of education, so we don't expect them to uh, to uh, get a salary for being an intern. 
but uh, as I say, some parishes have the means to be able to give students something while they're there, and that's uh, a generous of them, but not, uh, they're not obliged to do so. Uh, we have a little section there on extended uh, illness. Uh, you know, naturally, anyone can uh, come into a, a cold or a flu or whatever short-term illness. But if there is a, a significant extended illness, then uh, you know we need to deal with it in light of you know would it interfere with achieving what an internship uh, is about, or would we need to suspend it and have them come back at it? Or start over again, or whatever the case might be. So we we have uh, you know just laid out uh, the anticipation of how we would uh, deal with that at least in generalities, knowing that every situation would be a bit different. We've also included you know what might happen if for some reason the uh, field supervisor, the pastor happens to be unavailable because of illness or for other reasons. We always try to avoid putting a student in a place where the pastor is going to have a foreseeable move, uh, move or absence during the uh, during the internship. Uh, confidentiality, of course, is a, uh, is a very important uh, aspect for students to be aware of. And in our courses, they've all had exposure to uh, matters about those things. But uh, uh, knowing and understanding confidentiality is such an important aspect of, um, of ministry and knowing and understanding the limitations on confidentiality as well, particularly if it pertains to situations where there's suspicion of abuse of a child or a minor. Other than that, generally speaking, uh, if a person receives information in confidence in a pastoral context, they would only share it with others with the person's uh, permission. Uh, if, for instance, a student is uh, uh, visiting a parishioner and the parishioner shares something that they feel is very serious, uh, then, uh, but it would, might not be a legal matter in the sense of uh, being obliged to report because a person is likely to do harm to themselves or to another. Uh, or tells about uh, knowledge or information they have of their own or someone else's abuse of a minor, um, then, uh, but, it, but it might be a matter of serious consequence, then uh, they should tell the person or get the permission of the person to discuss it at least with the pastor uh, if it is a serious matter. Matters that are uh, the ones I mentioned before, you're legally bound to report them and so uh, uh, you have no choice. Any, every, any, and every adult is expected to report uh, situations of suspicious abuse of a child or other vulnerable person, including the elderly. Um, expectations concerning sexual conduct uh, of uh, candidates and interns. I mean, essentially, that is following the policies of their respective dioceses on, on those matters. Um, and then early uh, termination of an internship, if for some reason it's not working out, well then we have processes in, a pla in place to deal with that type of stuff. And um, then uh, procedures for early termination uh, are there. And uh, so that's pretty well everything that the manual needs to have in it. And uh, the last little section that I'm going to take just a few moments on are matters pertaining to constructive feedback. And there are what we describe as basic principles of leadership. Uh, and these are our principles that really a person in a leadership role ought to do what they can to guide all of their actions by doing these types of things. That this is how they live. In other words, this would be the character uh, and their behaviors when they're dealing with others. That they would focus on the situation or issue or behavior, not on the person. In other words, somebody might be doing something wrong and they need to be corrected on it. We shouldn't approach the person as if they themselves are wrong. Or on to the second one, make them feel that they are wrong or inadequate, or in other words, uh, damage their self-confidence or self-esteem. So focus on situation, issue, or behavior, not on the person. Maintain the self-confidence and self-esteem of others. Maintain constructive relationships with others. 
take initiative to make things better, lead by example, and look beyond the moment. You know, one of the critical things for leaders to do is to examine whatever the situation or issue or problem is, but think beyond it. You know, we can be we can be infuriated by something that's happening right here in front of us and react to it and react to it in ways that really uh, do in the long term more damage than good. We've all seen that. <laughs> Things yeah. happen. My God, we wind up making them so much worse than the actual incident itself. And so uh, thinking beyond the moment and determining uh, what's the best way for me to respond to this, that can do the most good for most people. and reduce the amount of harm to everyone or to anyone. Um, finding ways to blame or shame or punish others is not a good leadership strategy. <laughs> Likewise, dealing with things in generalities for leadership or feedback, feedback strategy. Sometimes people call it the hint and hope methods where rather than deal with the person or the few who are you know the problem an email or a text or a memo or whatever is sent to everyone saying everyone should do this that or the other thing when that's actually only a few in fact research shows that has very negative consequences because it makes those who are doing the who are not performing up to par to feel well nobody must nobody else must be doing it either so i'm fine or, and then it has the other negative impact of making those who are doing their best feel as if I'm even, I'm not even noticed here. The only ones getting noticed around here are the people who are not doing it right or not doing well or not uh, contributing. And I'm spoken to as if I'm not, you know. This is referred to somewhat, uh, I think, accurately and maybe cynically as the, uh, the hint and hope method of leadership. Doesn't work, but often used. <laughs> by my observation at least. So when there is an issue that someone needs some constructive feedback on, and notice we're not calling it criticism, it's constructive feedback, things that will correct them and, and build them up, make things better for them. First thing to do is state the purpose of it. Why I'm telling you this? Why I'm telling you that you shouldn't preach as long? Why I'm telling you that you shouldn't be talking about yourself as much? Why I'm telling you you shouldn't always be uh, complaining about this or the other thing, you know. So you state the purpose of it. And the second thing that adds kind of uh, uh, validity to it is that you describe specifically what you have observed. I noticed the last three times that you were at this meeting, when you were asked a question, you went on for uh, a long time explaining uh, what you did, you know, somewhere else that you were appointed or you've been accounting for everything by your illnesses or whatever the case might be, you know. So I've noticed this, you know, you're, you're not just kind of uh, repeating hearsay or gossip or speculating or what have you. It's specific to what you've observed. Nobody can argue with it, in other words. And then you describe your reactions. You, you go by telling the person, you know, when, when you do this, this is what I feel. You know, when, when you make all the conversations about yourself, my reaction is to say this person is <laughs> not too interested in me or anyone else or anyone else's problems. They're really only concerned about themselves. And I feel left out of that. And I feel bad that you're not using your gifts the way that you could be or should be or whatever the case might be. So you're describing it, your, your reactions. And then um, you provide the other person with the opportunity to respond. Now, one of the things about it is that these things are done fairly rapidly. You don't spend a long time describing the person because it becomes then quite intimidating, somewhat embarrassing. But also, if it takes you two or three minutes to get to the point of allowing the person to say something, they've become very defensive. And also, they've, they're not listening to you after the first little bit. They start then to think, now, what can I say to defend myself? And so the longer you leave it, the less likely you are to get the person to engage in matters that will actually make a difference. They start to, you know, 
if you, you go on for two or three minutes before you give them an opportunity to comment, they will by that time have a, uh, uh, an explanation generated in their own mind. So you give the person an opportunity to respond and then uh, you offer specific suggestions as well as their own suggestions that they might have and summarize and express your support. So a couple of rules of thumb on it. One is that if you can't think of a constructive purpose for giving feedback, don't give it at all. In other words, don't criticize people if you can't, if there isn't something that you can say that can, could help them to make things better. That ain't going to happen in an internship because that's exactly why they're there and the nature of your relationship with them is to give them that type of guidance. But <coughs> there are situations where <coughs> people give criticism just for the sake of it. And the other rule of thumb is it shouldn't take any longer than 60 seconds to get to key action four. And key action four is the one about giving the person an opportunity to respond. So feedback to anyone on anything, whether it's uh, parents or giving your children or teachers in school or uh, people on support teams with interns in the parish internship program. Uh, Giving feedback needs to be for the purpose of improvement. It needs to be specific. Um, I was, uh, 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 it needs to have a, a purpose uh, to, as I say, make things, improve things. It needs to be specific on what uh, was observed and uh, uh, that you engage in it as a genuine partner, trying to support the person by telling how what you have observed makes you feel and then you give the person an opportunity to respond to that those are generalities it's not something that you need to sit down and practice and what have you but the major focus on it is to you know have a little bit of a strategy in your mind to how you're going to say this to the person so that they don't aren't shattered by it but they understand that this is serious, I need to look at it so that I can make the changes that I need to make and practice them while I'm still in this safe environment of, a, uh, <coughs> of an internship. And uh, it's there then that they'll make that move of going from thoughts to actions to habits to character to destiny. So uh, the very last thing I want to pop up is a slide that just uh, kind of illustrates how all well this works together. I'll give you the slides if you want to look at them on, on your own. But uh, the intern is at the, the core. But we're all around them. The support team and the field supervisor and the faith community generally and Queens College. We're all uh, around the student to help them to discern what it is that God is calling them to so that they can go out to provide leadership in the venture that we call the church or the budding forth of the kingdom of God. People preparing for ministry today are uh, courageous to take it on. Uh, you know, the, the matters that we uh, were mentioned here earlier about the amount of support for clergy and uh, those types of things have changed quite a bit. and. Uh, people who continue in ministry and people who uh, are discerning a call to ministry in the 21st century are uh, courageous and uh, so we, we want to do everything we can to support them everything we can do to support you yourselves too but uh, field supervisors and team members and what have you to make it a, a good experience for all hands any last minute questions comments observations Getting tired of listening now. I know you are. You should be if you're not. <laughs> Neil, anything from you online? No, not at all. Sounds good. It was okay. awful early. If we're finishing your course at nine o'clock, that's awful early. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get ready for part two now. <laughs> oh, I, I kind of figured it was a catch. <laughs> so they start next week? It starts on Tuesday. Okay. Uh, Reverend John comes a bit late because he has a doctor's appointment. And um, so when he gets there, he gets there. Yeah. Yeah. And then you get things moving and uh, you'll 
connect with someone to take the leadership in your group, and Neil will be doing the same in, in theirs, and it'll move on from there. I'll be in touch with you over the course of the fall. Of course, I'll be getting the forms and reports on a, a regular basis. We don't. We try not to, you know, be there to interfere. We're here to be of support, but we do make a visit to each uh, parish. Usually what I'll do is get in touch with uh, with uh, the pastor and, uh, you know, look at a time that the team might be meeting and then make it into one event where I go and have a meeting with the pastor, meet with the team, and meet with the intern as well. That's usually done the latter part of the, the latter part of the semester. So if there isn't anything else, thank you all for coming. Uh, and uh, when you get out, now you better check your text to see the wind chase the ace or some blonde to you. Win, that'd be better. It'd be pretty good. Well, that'd be some blonde make us <laughs> But anyway, we'll see how it goes. Thank you for having us. Somebody from CBS wanted, actually. Who was it? Who was it? <laughs> I don't know. I, I just saw a, a message on Facebook. Somebody in CBS and her husband's going to retire. Oh, it is. oh my God, I hope it's my sister in law. My brother's going to retire because she said she'd share with me. <laughs> 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 well, I said, would you share with your crazy sister in law? And she came back and said, yes. Okay, well, let's well, go. Not me because I have no kids. I don't either. I don't win the way of the paper bank. <laughs> anyway, we'll wrap it up here, gang. Best of luck. Thanks for uh, being with us online, Neil. And we'll chat with some of you tomorrow, most likely. And on uh, on the video. Best luck to you all. Don and Mary Gorman. Who? Bye bye. Don and Mary Gorman. There we are.